It's good to see everybody this evening. If you can, find that bigger hymnal, number 234. Bigger hymn book, number 234. <clears throat> I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Amen. If you can, let's stand together and sing number 227 out of that bigger hymnal. 227. <clears throat> 227 in that bigger hymnal.
Amen. Hey, the Bibles, we'll turn to First Thessalonians chapter number 5. We will begin our reading in verse number 12. And I'm glad I've been touched. Uh, Josh and I talked about a song uh, we used to sing uh, years ago when they had singings on Friday night or Saturday night. Uh, and somebody touched me. And the song went like he touched me on a Monday or he touched me on a Tuesday or and whatever day that you got touched where well, you stood up. And uh, I thought that was mighty good because you go through the whole week and several folks couldn't stand up. So that gave you an idea who you were singing to or who you were going to preach to. Uh, but I'm glad I could stand up. I mean, I was the first one to jump when he got on a, on a Wednesday. I jumped up and made sure that they knowed that I knowed that I was in. A lot of folks today don't really know I'm being honest with you. A lot of folks go to a Baptist church and they just say, well, I hope I'm going to make it. If that's all I had, well, I'd be looking for something different. Or I wish, I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've wished for a lot of things, <laughs> never got it, but I'm glad I ain't wishing I've got it. And so I'm glad, I'm glad I'm part of the family of God tonight. I said last time when we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we looked at verses 1 through 11, and I talked about the but in verse number one, chapter five. It's just a continuation of the of chapter four, verses thirteen through eighteen. And of course, that deals with the, that deals with the resurrection, the rapture, and all of that. But it's just a continuation. And uh, we began to uh, look into the scripture, and it uses three phrases uh, that's used. First of all, verses one and two. He contrasts knowledge and ignorance. He said, I'd not have you to be ignorant, brethren. In verse 13 of chapter 4, he said, I'd not have you to be ignorant. You and I are not ignorant tonight. All right, let me say that. I don't think we ought, we, we ought not be because we got the, we got the book. Uh, we're living in a generation when a lot of religious people don't know what's coming down the pike. Uh, they, they, they come and go, and this is the way they do they come when they want to, and they stay at home when they want to. Uh, and a lot of them don't read the Bible. You can be the member of the, any Baptist church or any other denominational church. But you have to get in the book to know what's coming. And uh, it's plain. You, I mean, we talked about it last week. The Lord Jesus gave warning even in his day about the events that's going to come to pass in the last days, Matthew 24, if you began looking at that, and then you can go all the way back into the book of Genesis, and God's always delivered uh, those that look to Him. And so we talked about the times and the seasons. He said, I no need that I write unto you, you know. Uh, and of course, you go back and see in the scriptures in the New Testament where Paul and the Lord Jesus talked about uh, what's coming down the pike. And we know about it. Uh, the day of the Lord. Uh, I made mention of that. Uh, you find that the day of the Lord is when the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon this upon this world. He's going to He's going to pour the wrath out on the Gentile nations, and He's making preparations for Israel to receive their Messiah. And so the times and seasons and the days of the Lord are the day of the Lord. And then He talked about as the thief in the night, uh, that's the way it's going to come. It'll be quick and sudden. That's what the Bible says. First uh, uh, Corinthians chapter number 15, and I believe it's in about maybe verse 52. 51 says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's the trump. It's the last trump, and uh, dead's going to be raised. And he said in verse 52, I believe it is, of 1 Corinthians 15, It'll be in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. And I don't know how you describe the twinkling of an eye. It's so fast. And uh, uh, that's just as quick as it's going to be. It's going to be over. And I uh, I mean, the more I read and study and think about what's going to take place at the rapture, uh, this world is going to be uh, uh, astounded when all of them believers get moved out. And that's only ones that's going, ones that's got their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. It'll be a chaotic day when the Lord Jesus comes. Now, let me make somebody mad. 
There's a lot of Baptist folks that on the pew of the Baptist church that don't believe what I preach. I mean, Jesus said, in such an hour as you think not. I mean, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is going to come. And uh, uh, a lot of, lot of folks it's in the Baptist church and other denominational churches, they don't really believe that. I mean, if it did, we'd be doing different than what we are, would we not? I mean, I'm just being honest. And so that'll bring us down to verse number 12, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read all the remaining part of the, the, the chapter. And uh, I sat down today and got to re-looking. And I don't know that we might not even get through with these few verses tonight. There's so much in here. Uh, but I want you to stand with me, if you will, and Abel. If you're not, you just stay seated. Uh, but I want you to look with me in verses 12 through verse number 28. And then I'm going to come back and share some thoughts with you. And if we don't get through and the Lord don't come, we'll pick it up next Wednesday night. It's going to be the short night. It's a, it's a uh, business meeting night the next Wednesday night, so uh, that'll just give me time to get something said. L- listen to what he said. Now, Paul is, Paul is warned, and he's, he's, uh, he's revealed to us in uh, chapter 4 and in the early part of chapter 5. He uses the, the ye, the we, and the us's. He's talking about folks that saved by the grace of God. Then he's talking about the they and the them. And the they and them is unbelievers. And so there's two classes of folks here. And so he comes back and he tells us that, that uh, uh, they're going to be as a, as a woman with child, travail. Uh, uh, and so he makes a distinction between the believer and the non-believer. But listen to what he says in verse 12. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, there it is again, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. That's a mouthful within itself, ain't it? Notice what it's saying. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But every, every follower that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you, who also will do it. I like that. Brethren, there it is again. Pray for us. Greet all the brethren, there it is again, with an holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren, there it is again. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Father, we thank you for this portion of your word. Pray now the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts through your word, by your spirit. I pray we might leave tonight rejoicing, saying it's been good to be in the house of God. You know our hearts and our needs, and I pray every need will be met. I pray our hearts will be challenged tonight to be a better person tomorrow than we've been today. I pray you'll help us to be about your business. Tell others about the grace and mercy of our Lord. I pray now that you'll help us open our hearts and minds to receive the truth and all that's accomplished. We'll thank and praise you because we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And you might be seated. I went back and um, got to looking again at that word, brethren. I don't know if you, I tried to point it out, and I might have missed one or two, 
but it seems like when you study the Bible, you'll find in Paul's epistles, he uses that word several times. I went back and looked into the scripture and looked in some commentaries today and found out that in Paul's epistles alone, he uses that, that word, brethren, 60 times in his letters. You'll find as he writes to those at Thessalonica in the eight chapters 5 and uh, 1 Thessalonians 3 and 2 Thessalonians, then he uses the word brethren 27 times. Well, that's a lot. I believe when it's there that many times, it's there to get our attention and to make us aware uh, that Paul is writing to those uh, that are part of the family of God as Paul is a part of the family of God. And you go back and study Paul's epistles and you read his writings, you'll find that Paul likens the church to a family. And really that's what we are, are we not? We are the family of God. I mean, every one of us that's been born again by the Spirit of God, we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. So uh, he likens the church like a family. And so when you go to looking at Paul's writings, and especially to those in Thessalonica at this time to whom he's writing, He's uh, making them aware of what's, what's about to take place. He's reminding us uh, about the revelation in chapter number four. He's reminding us about the resurrection. He's reminding us about the rapture. He's reminding us about the reunion. And now he's going to tell us in these verses what we need to do as believers until this time comes about. Somebody asked a question not long ago said, when is these events going to come to pass? And I said, well, the Bible. And Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35 said, no man knoweth the day nor the hour. Not even the angels in heaven. Only the Father knows when he's going to send the Son after his bride. So we don't know. But here's the truth of the matter is, to whom he's writing, those at Thessalonica, to whom he's writing, those that are at Pleasant Hill, he's going to tell us in these verses what you and I need to do in order to accomplish the will of God and the purpose of God until Jesus comes. There are some things here. And I went back and uh, sat down. I really I really spent a little more time today than I thought I would, but uh, you go back and look at these verses. This, this verse is 12 uh, through 28, and you'll find there are some commandments given in these verses. Now, somebody said, what is a commandment? Well, I'm going to point them out to you. I underscored them. I wrote them down on a piece of paper because if I underscored them, I forget what I underscored them for. And uh, so I, I wrote them down. But listen, there's 22 commandments in verses 12 through 28. How many know that? I mean, 22 commandments. Jesus said in John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. First thing that goes to a person's mind is talking about not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking, and this is not all the commandments. Somebody said, now this is Paul's commandments. It's the Word of God. It's the commandments of God. It's not Paul's commandments. It's commandments that God gave Paul by inspiration through the Word of God. And so there's some things that you and I need to know. There's some things that we need to understand and when you look at these verses, he's mainly talking about the leadership. And when you, when you say leadership, who are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about, first of all, the pastor is the under-shepherd and the deacon and the elders and those that's in place of leadership. I believe it includes everybody. Somebody said, well, what does that include? I believe a Sunday school teacher is going to give much of, uh, as much account to God for him or her teaching that Sunday school class as, as I'm going to give an account unto God as being the pastor of this church. It's serious business when you take a position in the church. I mean, I've had folks, uh, listen, I've been at churches, uh, and this is my third, and so you figure out who they are, but I've had folks to say, well, if nobody else won't do it, I guess I'll do it. I said, I ain't interested in you doing it. If you're going to do it because somebody else ain't going to do it, you don't need to do it yourself. Huh? That's the wrong attitude to have to start with. If nobody else will take it, I'll take it. Well, we'll just combine three or four classes and get a good one. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody said, well, you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Well, they hurt mine when they say, if we can't get nobody else to do it, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. I mean, that's a cop-out, is it not? 
So I think if you teach a Sunday school class or a discipleship training class or you got the young folks on a Wednesday night, I think you're going to give as much account to God for the way you teach and the way you conduct yourself as a preacher is. Because we're talking about leadership. There's a responsibility. I mean, we're going to be held accountable unto God. Is it not in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10 says we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account unto God for what we have done or what we have not done? I mean, that just simply means we're going to, we're going to answer to Him the way we do what we do and why we do what we do. But I, I wrote them all down and I probably won't get them all. But uh, there is a responsibility that we have as a spiritual leader. I mean, uh, uh, we're going to give an account unto God. We need, to, we need to give our dead level best. And I wish I could stand here and tell you I've done that all of these years. But I'm just going to be honest with you. There's times that I've not done my best. Mm. Now, I know somebody this will jump up and, up and say, well, I'd give it my all. I, if I could be around you for a little while, I probably could correct you on that. But I'm just saying, we've got to give an account unto God. Notice what he's saying in these verses. And I'll try to hurry and get us done. Uh, but I want you to notice what he said in that uh, verse number 12. We beseech you or we urge you, brethren, mentioned 27 times in these few verses, eight chapters. And he said, to know them which labor among you. I looked up that word know, and it just simply means to have an idea or carries the idea of knowing who's in leadership and who is responsible for the church. Now, who's the leader? According to the Bible, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Is that not right? And according to Hebrews chapter number, I believe it's 11 or 12, 13, I'd have to go back verse 7 and 17 in Hebrews chapter number 13. It talks about the leaders. It talks about those that have rule over you. Somebody said you just rule it with an a, 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 a iron hand. No. Uh, to rule means to lead. It means to set forth the example. I mean to uh, practice what you preach. Well, I've heard that a lot. Uh, Jehovah is king. I was a little feller. But I remember him saying, if, if we're going to be a Christian, we ought to practice what we preach. Don't be hypocritical about it. If you say you're saved, you ought to live like you're saved. You ought to act like you're saved. And you ought to talk like you're saved. And he said, you ought to practice what you preach. And that's good advice for anybody. And so he indicates that in these verses. To know them in that verse. We beseech you, brethren, that you know them that which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. I mean, encourage you, and instruct you, and help you. But it needs to be done from the Word of God. It needs to be taught from the Bible, our responsibilities. I mean, we need to know that we're to grow in grace. I mean, when a, when a person gets saved, you know how old I was? 26 when I got saved, I was a babe, according to what Peter said. I mean, I didn't know anything. I was 26 year old, and I was a babe. I mean, I was still on milk, according to the Bible. Now, there's responsibility according to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. He said, grow in grace. That's another command. It's not an option. He said, we're to grow in grace. The only way you can grow in grace is to get into the Word of God, allow the Holy Spirit to be your teacher, and be willing to accept and obey what He teaches you and reveals to you to do. That's the only way you can grow in grace is to mind and obey the Word of God. And so he said, we need to know them and uh, uh, that admonish you. And then he said to esteem them or treat them uh, very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now, I want to go through these in a hurry. I'm going to stop right there and you need to write them down where you know I'm telling you right. I wrote them and, and if I, I we would never get through it if I take them one at a time. Might come back sometime and do it. But if you go back and look, uh, he said, comfort yourselves together. That's the first command. Uh, and that means to encourage one another in the faith. Second is edify one another. Third is to know. And then to know them that teach you. Uh, the fourth is to esteem. The fifth is to be at peace among yourselves. Six through nine. The sixth is warn them 
that are unruly. That's a command. That's a responsibility. And there are those that are believers that are unruly. Listen, we got believers in the church that's never grown up, and they want to do their own thing. They want to go their own way. And it, it, the, the spiritual leaders of the church is responsible to encourage them that lack in the areas in which they lack. It's, it's my place and your place as a teacher to encourage them. I mean, uh, when folks come and they, they, they get in for a little bit and then they go to slacking off and go to backing off, it's our place to go and remind them and to encourage them to continue to grow in grace and in knowledge. And if we're not very careful, that's what's happening in the Baptist churches today. We're letting folks fall through the cracks. I mean, we'll have a, we'll have a, a big addition, and after a while, that big addition will drop back down just like it was. And it's our place... It's our place to help them and remind them and to encourage them and to teach them what they need to do as a child of God. Uh, you'll find uh, it talks about warning them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, and then he said support the weak, be patient toward all men, uh, see that none render evil for evil. That's not an option. That's a command. And if you go back and just read all these, uh, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, what God is teaching in these verses. He said, uh, See that none render evil for evil, follow that which is good, uh, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, uh, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, above all things. Uh, uh, well, I can't even read more right. Hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearances of evil. Paul said, pray for us. Is that not amazing? I read that this morning. I was sitting in the study and Paul uh, knew the languages of that day and the days to come. Uh, one of the most educated men in, in the ministry and he said, pray for us. You know, some Baptist folks ain't got enough. They got so much pride they won't ask nobody to pray for them. Every one of us need prayer. I'm just being honest with you. But he said, pray. That's a, if you go back and study that's not an option. He's setting those at Thessalonica. He says, pray for us. Not 21. Uh, greet all brethren with a holy kiss. I'll talk about that in days to come down the road. And then he said, this epistle needs to be read to all men. That's 22 commands found in these verses. And that's not counting what Jesus commands that we overlook. You know what? We read the Bible so fast sometimes we don't really know what it says. I mean, most of us got these quarterlies and we'll, di we'll get that daily Bible read now and it might, be, uh, it might be maybe 10 or 12 verses. We'll read them verses so fast and get laid down. We get up in the morning and fast ask you what you read before you went to bed. You couldn't tell me. How'd I know that? Because I'd done it myself. Huh? I'm just telling you, we read it so fast sometimes we don't really catch what he's saying. I mean, if you didn't know, uh, would you have thought from 12 to 28 there'd be 22 commandments given in the Bible in these short verses? Would you have thought of that? But they're there. I mean, I've read them to you, except that and I couldn't read. I couldn't read more right on that. Somebody said, I'd like to have your notes. I said, the only chicken can read that's the one that scratched it. What do you know good to get what I write? Uh, but I know what it said. Sometimes I know what it said. But do you see what you see what I'm saying? What Paul is telling us, uh, he said, the, the, the spiritual leaders, them that's responsible, those that are mature, man, we've got a job to do. We've got a responsibility before God, and we have a responsibility toward God, but yet we have a responsibility toward them that, that, are, that make up the body of Christ. There's some weak. I mean, I'd love to go back sometimes and uh, just take these one at a time and just work our way through them and see what it says. What does it mean uh, to not render evil for evil? Well, I'll just tell you, I believe it means not to be too angry. Not to retaliate. Be forgiven or forgive. I mean, there's a lot to be said, but all he's doing in verses 12 through 28, he's telling you and I in light of the coming of the Lord Jesus, he's just telling us what we ought to do. For those that make up the body of Christ, we're to edify one another. We're to build up one another, are we not? That's found in the book of Galatians. 
And, I, and I, like I said, if you go back into the book of Galatians, you pick your section and you mark in, those, in that section of Scripture in Galatians, you're going to find where he commands those at Galatia. He commands them to do certain things when he's commanding them at Galatia. He's commanding you and I at Pleasant Hill. I mean, the Bible is full of commandments. And Jesus said, if you love me, you can keep my commandments. Somebody said, I do my best. Our problem is we don't know what the commandments are. We read too fast. We don't comprehend and let soak in what we read. And so the scripture indicates to us that we need to, we need to accept them. If you go back and look in these verses, he said uh, we need to accept them. and We need to appreciate them. You need sometimes, I'm not going to do it tonight, but you need sometimes, you just need to go to Hebrews chapter 13 and read verse number 7 and read verse number 17 and it deals with the same thing. Those that are leaders are those that have rule over you, and that's the one that's responsible, the preachers, to teach the Word of God and not, uh, not uh, any other uh, material. I mean, our material needs to come out of the Bible. Uh, uh, and commentaries is good. I mean, I, sometimes I'll get the quarterly. Uh, me and Barbara, Barbara was reading last night. We was talking around at the house. She was reading a short devotion, and one of the commentaries made some statements that I disagree with. Uh, somebody said, who is he? I said, well, I can't tell you what his name is, but he's a Southern Baptist. I disagreed what he said. I mean, because he writes a book don't mean he's always right. And I got enough sense to know that I probably, in my early days, I, tried to, I might have said some things that be contrary to the will of God and the Word of God, but I've, been, I've, I've learned better. And you know how I learned better? By getting in the book and see what's contrary. I mean, you have to... It, it, you have to get in the book. He tells us in those verses, if you go back and study in these verses, he said, listen, uh, know them that are among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you. He said to esteem them, thank them, thank of them highly uh, and love, uh, love them for the work's sake. I believe we're to love our, 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 our leaders, we're to love our, our, our preacher. I, well, I thought on this when I said, Bob, at the house. I said, man, I don't know of another church that loves a preacher any more than Pleasant Hill. I mean, you're not, you don't just say it, you've proved it. I mean, in my life, in my time here, uh, it's one thing to sell folks that you, Tommy Whaley used to get on folks. He said, well, we'll go through and tell everybody we love them. And he said, we do it out of habit. We don't really mean what we say. He said, if you love somebody, you ought to prove it to them. I mean, you know, how do you do that when they need, when they, when they got a need? And I tell you, I've learned over the years. I've learned over, you cannot outgive God. You may think you ain't got it, but if you got it and you'll give it, God will give it back. I'm just telling you. I mean, I, I'm, I'm telling you, out of all the years uh, that I've been a child of God, I've never lacked. Now, I ain't always had my wants filled, but I've never hurt for anything. I mean, God has always supplied my need. Uh, it, it, I could tell you some stories that would uh, make you hire stand up on the back of your neck. <laughs> how that you uh, be, be, have, a, have a bill coming up and you ain't got it to pay. And yet it'd come through mail from somebody that heard you in a revival or met you in North Carolina. It's amazing to what God can do. I've, uh, at Oak Hill, we had three or four fellows that went to the Liberty Bible College, Jerry Falwell. And I mean, these folks were poor folks and them boys... I mean, they come home and uh, they come to church and they go to telling you how that God provided uh, on campus those things that they needed. And they learn if they got it and somebody else needs it, give it to them and God will give it back to you. You won't ever out give God. And I'm telling you, God is, God is faithful. And he's going to tell us that in, in, in verses to come. But he said, we're to love them. We're to obey them. And the reason you're to obey them is because they tell you the truth. I mean, uh, I've heard a saying some years ago that the preacher says, don't do as I do, do as I say. That's not a good example, is it? I mean, uh, I, w would it not be hypocritical for me to tell you to do something and me not do it? Uh, that's why when we take offering, I mean, I try to make it a point. I want you to know I'm not taking for somebody, not asking you to give where I wouldn't give myself. 
I mean, if I, if, if I can't give, if I don't think they're suitable for it, I ain't got no business taking it up. You see what I'm saying? I mean, he's just telling us what we need to do and how we need to do. We need to obey them. And then verses 14 through 16 talks about a partnership. Look, now we exhort you, brethren, there that word is again, warn them that are unruly, comfort them, or comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient toward all men. I mean, that's a, that's a, that, that would be, a, that would be a, a week's preaching right there, would it not? I mean, if you take those, exhort. We exhort you, encourage you, we instruct you, brethren. Warn them that are unruly. Who is unruly? Well, you've got those that saved that's not growed in grace. You know, that word unruly, it means like a soldier getting out of step. Y'all ever watch Gomer Powell when it comes on? Uh, that's about all it is good to watch. But old Gomer will be a smiling he'll get out of step. That's what that word unruly means. It means folks in the church that they want to do their own thing. They want to do it the way they want to do it. And that ain't the way you do it. You do God's work the way God tells you to do it. The way God reveals to you. So those that's unruly, they get out of step. I've heard some folks say in days gone by, I said that feeble-minded is talking about folks that's with mental problems. No, it's not. No, sir. It's not talking about folks with a, uh, with a mental problem. Uh, he's talking about folks that's uh, uh, similar to the same. They got their own thoughts and own ideas of how things ought to be done. We're going we're gonna to take these in days to come. We're going we're gonna to look at this. But the scripture indicates in verse 15, he said, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And then he comes in to rejoice evermore. You remember, the, is it not in the book of Philippians? It's in chapter 3 or chapter 4, verse number 2. Rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Now, joy is not a product of an individual. A joy is a product of the Holy Spirit. If you go to Rome, uh, Galatians chapter 5, I believe it's verse 21 22, love, peace, and joy. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10 said the joy of the Lord is our strength. I mean, in difficult times, we can still rejoice. I mean, even in times of what's coming for those at Thessalonica, the revelation, the rapture, the return. Listen, he said in spite of that time, you can rejoice. I mean, you can rejoice under some bad circumstances. I mean, things might not be going well, but you can still rejoice. Why? Because of who he is and what he's done and what he's doing in your life. He not only says rejoice evermore, but he says pray without ceasing. That indicates that we just need to be persistent and consistent in our praying. I mean, I told you time and time again, you don't have to be in this altar to pray. Matter of fact, you don't have to be knelt down beside your bed to pray or around your coffee table to pray. I, you can ride down the Van Town Road in a blue Toyota pickup truck and you can commune with God the Father while you're driving down the road. I mean, uh, he indicates that we ought to keep a prayer on our heart. But David said three times, I, three times a day I pray, morning, noon, night. I'm just telling you, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Always something to pray about. Somebody needs your prayers. I like what, to, and I was trying to think, he pastored the Oak Hill Church for a while, lived in Shebbable. He's dead now. But he and I talked before he died, and he had a little composition book that he kept in his pocket. And uh, somebody in town, or he run across somebody at a restaurant, and they mentioned their need for prayer. He took that little book out and wrote it down. James Locke, he done the same thing. He said, I made a habit of, if anybody stopped me or uh, in the conversation brought their prayer need up, he said, I wrote it down where I wouldn't forget it. I mean, it's important that we pray. I, I mean, that's what I get when he said pray without ceasing. I mean, there's, I mean, somebody uh, needs you to pray for them. And not only that, but he comes back and said in everything, give thanks. 
everything. Not just in the good stuff, but in the bad stuff as well. He said, Rabbi, I mean, if somebody said, you can't do that. Yes, you can. You ever looked at Romans chapter 8, verse 28? All things work together for good to them to love God, them to call according to his purpose. I mean, all things, we need to give thanks for everything. I mean, when God allows some circumstances to come about that's uh, not comfortable in our lives, don't you think he might be teaching us something? I mean, sometimes we have to go through, the, 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 the most time you'll learn is when you get in a predicament. I mean, you'll learn when you get down in the valley, when uh, somebody's throwing rocks at you, when somebody's talking about you. I mean, when hardships come, that's when we call on God more. That's when we, that's when we experience His presence more. When everything's running smooth, we forget to pray, do we not? You notice I put the we in there. I mean, uh, we have to be careful. Uh, so he says, pray without ceasing. Not only that, uh, to give thanks for everything. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Paul, uh, he talks about to quench and grieve. And uh, the word quench means to throw water on the, on the fire, smother it down. See, that's what happens on some Sunday mornings. Now I'm going to make somebody mad. But you come in on Sunday morning, man, things gets going good and the Holy Ghost gets to work and want to pop up over here and testify and somebody will jump over here and testify and somebody over here will testify and then, a, then a one that's been out of the will of God, somebody that's not been in six months will jump up and try to testify and it knocks it, it quenches. You want to testify, you better make sure it's of God because if the Spirit's running good and it's high, and things is fixing to happen real good, some old deadhead can jump up and start talking about what I ain't so used to do. Knock it right in the head. Y'all agree to that? I'm just telling you right. I mean, I've, I've been around long enough that I can tell what's, what's good and what ain't. Old James Locke, he said, well, you're not quench all that wildfire. I said, that's a, get the wildfire going, some good fire will get going. But I'm just telling you, we can, we can knock it in the head if we're not very careful. I mean, we can, we can quench, we can dampen the Spirit of God by not doing what's right. And I, you can be here, God, touch your heart to testify or touch your heart to sing a song, and you don't do that, you're quenching the Holy Spirit. I mean, in the old building, I mean, I've, we've seen folks saved, not ever have preaching. But you know why? Because folks did not quench the Spirit of God. They've done what they know they're supposed to do. And God used that individual or those individuals and worked in the heart and life of somebody else and people got saved by our being obedient to the Spirit of God. I know, I know what the Bible said. Uh, he's chosen by the foolish preaching to save them that'll believe. But I'm just telling you, it ain't got to have preaching all the time. They've heard it somewhere, but if you'll obey God, quench not. And then he said in the, uh, the book of Ephesians, he said, grieve not, don't hurt the Holy Spirit. Uh, don't sadden the Holy Spirit. And so he says, quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. I told y'all, you done forgot it, I'll tell you again. <laughs> Hadn't been saved too long. And, uh, my brother was uh, about four or five years older than me and uh, we used to run around with the same crowd. And after I got saved, uh, one night Larry said, a couple of the fellas is coming over, and we're going to go down to, we're going to go down to Pizza Hut and sit and talk and eat pizza. And I thought that's what we was going to do. Uh, and so I went with them. Hadn't been saved long. Sat down at that table, and the waitress come, and ordered a large pizza. One ordered a bud, and one ordered a slits, and I ordered a Coke. And the more I sat there, Bob, and I got to thinking, and I said, folks who look at that Coke don't know what's in that Coke. I was miserable. I mean, I, I, I didn't have no business there because uh, I was hooked on that mess. I mean, that mess had control of me at one time. And uh, there I was sitting with them four fellas, and they was a drinking their beer, and I was a drinking my Coke. I was uncomfortable. And... Uh, I think when you look at that, to abstain from all appearance. It, 
Somebody didn't know. I mean, they couldn't know what I might have had a little bourbon in that Coke. And I was uncom- I mean, I was, I was out of place. Yeah. You ever been there? You ever been where you, some places you ought not be, give you a bad testimony? It's good, ain't it? I mean, it's, he's telling us what we ought, how we ought to act, what we ought to do. I mean, that's all he's doing. And then uh, he comes back in these verses and uh, he said, And the very God of peace sanctify or separate you holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved or kept. I'm glad I'm preserved. <laughs> uh, that word kept, in, uh, it's in Second Peter chapter 2, and it's in verse number 4. It talks about being kept by the power of God. I'm kept. Somebody said, what do you mean by that? I'm saved forever. I'm forever saved. I had a fellow one time said, you don't know how you're going to end up. I said, no, I don't. But I know this. I know I serve a God. If I don't live right and do right, I'm afraid he'd take me out. I mean, preacher after preacher. I had an uncle. I told you about it. Hit that little sapling tree, went that big around. Broke his neck. He got saved. Got to running with the wrong crowd again. Hit that little sapling tree. One of the girls said, I'll just worry about daddy. I said, you ain't got to worry about daddy. I said, daddy got saved. I said, he saved eternally. Yeah. I mean, it's an imp- I can't get lost. I can't get out of the family of God. I wouldn't get out if I could get out. Yeah. But I'm saved forever. I'm eternally yeah. saved. Yeah. In the first John chapter 5, is it verse 17? He talks about them that don't do right. Uh, you, you can shorten your life by being disobedient yeah. and not doing what God tells you to do. And so, I mean, you look at the Scripture. We're preserved. Blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. He's just telling us how we're to do, what we're to be like, our responsibility. The feeble-minded, the weak, would encourage their hearts. Uh, And I'm just telling you, I've learned over the years that uh, every Christian is different in one way or the other. Some don't grow as fast as others. And that being patient with all men, I believe it's talking about those that don't comprehend and grow as fast as some. Well, I'm glad folks have been patient with me. I mean, somebody said you, you know, so I have to read something sometimes three times before I ever get a hold of it and understand what it's saying. But I'm not ashamed of it. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not. I mean, I, listen, I'm going to try my best to get what's right out of it. And I'm going to try my best to do what God says do. Uh, I might not catch it as fast as you, but if you give me time, I'll catch up with you after a while. He's just revealing to us the responsibility we have in light of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, somebody said, Preacher, what do you think the greatest responsibility of the church is today in light of the coming of the Lord? I'm going to tell you. I think he expects you and I to tell the old, old story. Share our faith. Tell what he's done for us. And he'll do the same thing for them. And I'm going to tell you, Pleasant Hill and probably every other Baptist church in this county is not doing what we ought to do. We ought to be knocking on doors. We ought to be, wherever we go, we ought to be telling the story. And I'm as guilty as you are. But we ought to be shaking the bushes. Time's short. One of these days, time's going to be no more. Yeah. And if the rapture were to come tonight, there's somebody on your heart and mind that you know that wouldn't go if you come tonight. That this simply means we ought to be telling, we ought to be talking, we ought to be a witnessing. And then when we come together on a Sunday morning and Sunday night, we ought to come and worship God and praise His name. We ought to make them as sinners get uncomfortable when they come. And I tell you what will do it, the Holy Spirit will make a man either get in or he'll get out. You come enough, you'll get saved. And uh, he'll get on your case. Uh, 
He does that work. That's his office work. And he does it through folks like you and I. Well, uh, see, that wound up First Thessalonians chapter 5. We may, we may take a couple of uh, Wednesday nights and let's just go back and look at them individual 22 commandments and see what he really says that you and I need to do. We may do that, I ain't for sure, but we may. You stand and come and Jeremy's going to go over the prayer list.